Hey folks, Chris Sanders here, and I'm very disappointed that I cannot be there with all of you in person today, but the show must go on, and I'm glad we're able to make that happen with Josh and I recording this presentation for you. Uh, I think a lot of people in the audience will be really excited to see some of the stuff we've got to share. Uh, again, if you don't know me, my name is Chris Sanders. I run a company called Applied Network Defense, where we focus on accessible information security training for practitioners. And I run a nonprofit called the Rural Technology Fund, where we work with teachers and communities uh, in rural and disadvantaged areas, give them the things they need to teach kids about computers, engineering, STEM, and the related career fields. I've written a few books over the course of my career, the most recent of which is called Intrusion Detection Honeypots, which is going to be pretty relevant for today's presentation. Hey there, Josh Brower here. I've been in IT uh, just under 20 years and just under 15 years in security. Uh, for the vast majority of that time, I've been involved in the international nonprofit community uh, where I focused on network and endpoint detection. Deployed Secured Onion for many years in those environments and actually joined Security Onion Solutions about two years ago where I work on further development of the platform as well as training. I've also uh, developed a couple classes with Applied Network Defense over the years, one focused on OS Query for security analysis and the other one on writing Sigma rules. You can catch me on Twitter at Defense of Depth. Would love to chat about uh, IT, security, D&D, uh, &D, or even coffee. So I think most folks in the audience have probably at least heard of a honeypot and maybe even have a basic idea of what one is. Formally, we define a honeypot as a security resource whose value lies in being probed, attacked, or compromised. And maybe a little bit more simplistically, it's basically something fake that we hope attackers will interact with for some sort of benefit to the network defender. There are lots of types of honeypots, but they alternately have four things in common. They are deceptive, so they pretend to be something that they're not. They're discoverable, which means an attacker can find them somehow. They're interactive, which means the attacker can exchange some sort of data with them or uh, provide a stimulus and cause some sort of effect. And because they're interactive, we can monitor that interaction through either logging or alerting. Now, chances are when you think of a honeypot, you probably think of what I would call an attack research honeypot. And these are honeypots that are used primarily to observe attacker or malware behavior um, out on the public internet. So uh, you generally uh, would place these outside your firewall or just anywhere where they're accessible on the internet with no real access to the internal network. Uh, and then you have some type of uh, system there or service that's listening uh, for some specific type of interaction, um, either just for general educational purposes or at least primarily for threat researchers. Folks who are really concerned with malware, uh, worm proliferation, uh, the proliferation of specific attacks and how certain things might be uh, exploited, things of that nature. Um, so again, the key thing is that these are uh, placed outside the firewall, visible to the internet. They're generally going to generate log data um, because you're going to go look at this, but you're not necessarily going to be notified of when these interactions occur because uh, the internet's noisy and you're going to see a lot of them. So uh, that's what we think of when we think of an attack research honeypot. And I mentioned that because I want you to kind of bracket that to the side because that's not the type of honeypot we're here to talk about today. We're going to talk about an intrusion detection honeypot, which is you know, certainly has all the same four characteristics of honeypots that I discussed a moment ago, but they manifest in very different ways. An intrusion detection honeypot is basically a form of intrusion detection system, just like Suricata is signature-based intrusion detection, and we have anomaly-based intrusion detection systems, and IDH is another form of that sort of thing. Um, it's generally, in this case, going to be used by blue teamers, so the folks who are actually building detection, doing detection engineering, and the analysts who would investigate the alerts from those things. There are a couple of main characteristics that really differentiate um, an IDH from other forms of honeypot. One of those is that they are almost always placed inside the network. So the idea is that an attacker who has already compromised your network will stumble across one of these honeypots. Now you may ask yourself, well, well, if that point, if the attacker is already in there, then what's the point? And I think the thing to fall back on here is that just because an attacker has a foothold on your network does not mean that they have won. Um, they have not really won until it becomes a breach, until they've stolen something or caused some sort of sort of negative impact uh, on your network in some way. So we still want to try 
very aggressive to detect them even after they've gotten that initial foothold and certainly that's a viable thing to do. So we're placing those inside the network. Uh, these are generally going to generate alerts. They're not going to be very noisy because they're inside the network and nobody should communicate with them uh, legitimately because they're not legitimate assets. So they're going to generate alerts along with log data and these can manifest in a lot of different ways, um, generally either as services or tokens and we'll talk about um, those things here in just a little bit. So uh, a couple of other key things I just want you to keep in mind as it pertains to IDH and what really makes IDH work. First, nobody should ever interact with an intrusion detection. scanners or something like that that might hit it, but you can very simply allow list these things and make sure you're not generating alerts from those things. So you should get very few false positives, and if you do, they're very easy to investigate and tune out. Attackers are very unlikely to discover that something is an IDH, and even if they do, it doesn't really matter a whole lot because you already know that they are there, so you can respond quickly. That's essential. And finally, there are lots of opportunities for deception with IDH. So you can lure attackers into an IDH in a number of different ways. You can get insanely creative with these techniques, and that's one of the reasons I like it. It lets me really flex my creative muscles and do some unique things that I wouldn't be able to do with the limitations of signature-based IDS and even a lot of anomaly-based IDS things. So with that said, let's talk about some of these use cases. And I want to start with this scenario and, and lots of scenarios, we know that an attacker has to gain an initial foothold onto a victim system before they can really further their attack. So there's a lot of ways that might happen. Um, let's consider the scenario where an attacker um, sends a malicious email with either an attachment or a link to a victim. The victim then clicks that link, runs a file, ultimately leads to some sort of code execution, and the attacker has access to that victim machine and is therefore in control of it. Now, there's a lot of things that could happen at this point. Um, an attacker with that full access can do really anything they want, but they're tr obviously trying to achieve some sort of goal. And what I generally notice is that attackers will, you know, kind of early on do at least one of three major things um, in some sequence, in some order that I've seen from my time as a defender and from doing these things myself uh, as a little bit of time as a red teamer um, too. So, you know, one of those things, really the first thing I would consider that an attacker might do, and these are in no specific order, um, is they might pillage for files, right? So the attacker controls the system and they're going to go digging around for files that are relevant to the attacker's goal. So something that um, either has sensitive information that's useful to them or something that um, could help them expand their compromise in the network. They're going to look for those sort of things. So if you imagine an attacker is browsing around the network and they grab a bunch of these files and they're opening them or they're downloading them and then opening them wherever they are, well, one of the things we can do here is hide a honey file, right? And this is a pretty cool thing. It's the idea that we create a file that is fake. It has no real value, but it looks interesting in, in name. And the attacker opens it. Let's say maybe it's a spreadsheet. What we can do is embed what we would call a web bug into that, which is a reference to an image on an external web server. So when someone opens that file, it tries to go out and get that external image from the web server. But in our case, the image doesn't actually exist. The reference to it is hidden in the document. There's a lot of neat ways to do that. And when it goes out and hits that web server, well, we control that web server and it is going to generate logs. Those logs are going to tell us the IP address that came from, and we can tie a couple of other interesting things into that as well. So in this case, we would know when the document is open because we would get an alert when those logs are generated. Not only that, we're going to know where it was open from, which could be our victim machine, which could be the, the, you know, the foothold into the network. Or if the attacker pulled it back to their system, we might actually get their IP address, which could be pretty neat. You might think attackers are too smart to allow that thing to happen. I think you might be surprised on that. So this is this notion of pillaging for files. This is what we would call a honey token where we're mimicking legitimate data, and we can do that in lots of different ways. So the second scenario, which I think is pretty common, is dumping credentials. It's fairly obvious why attackers would want credentials. They can use those to further their compromise and uh, you know, get into other systems. So in this case, there are a number of techniques an attacker can use to dump credentials. Uh, one of the more popular is using uh, a tool like Mimikatz to dump from LSAS or LSA secrets or any other uh, number of other locations. What we can do in this case is actually embed fake credentials alongside these locations. Since we know where the attacker is looking, we can make sure the attacker will receive these fake credentials. In this case, we're talking basically honey credentials. They mimic legitimate data. They look like a username and password, but they're not. They will not actually allow the attacker to authenticate anywhere. 
but we can monitor for this. If it is a fake username and nobody should ever use it, we can very easily create detection signatures that tell us anytime someone does try to use it. If someone does try to use it, we know where they stole it from because it only exists in specific places. So you can leverage lots of these in lots of different places on your networks to do some really cool things. It can be a clear text password, it can be a password hash, SSH keys, any other form of authentication um, token or credential is pretty valid for this use case. Now, uh, let's talk about this third thing an attacker might do. And this is the one I wanna focus on because it's specifically relevant to the demo that Josh is about to show you. In this case, the attacker has compromised the victim and they're very interested in learning about the network. They wanna learn maybe where they are in the network, what type of organization it is, if it's not specifically targeted, or maybe they just want to figure out where they can move next, look for other vulnerable services or places where they can leverage previously stolen credentials. So they're probably scanning in this case. It may be using a custom tool, maybe something um, that we could all use, a uh, public source available. It could be a very wide scan. It could be a very targeted scan. But the thing that the attacker is not going to know is that when they are scanning host is that one of the hosts we have placed out there is, you guessed it, it's a honeypot. It's a honey service. And it is basically out there for no other purpose than to listen to probe requests. And if someone sends a probe to it on whatever service we have out there, FTP, SSH, anything, it is going to let us know because we're going to log that data and we will alert an analyst that that occurred because nobody should ever be communicating with this system. Some light potential for false positives, but very easy to sort out once you allow list, again, things like your internal vulnerability scanners, um, things that normally generate broadcast traffic on specific network segments. Very trivial to do um, once you set one of these up. So this is kind of the scenario we're looking at here with a honey service where we're mimicking the interaction of a specific software or protocol function, uh, in this case, listening on, on the network. And we've got lots and lots of, uh, of options for this. So these are really the three main ways I see attackers, um, you know, they're, generally, they're not going to do all of these things. Sometimes they may, may do them in varying orders, but at some point with that initial foothold, usually you're going to see one of these three things. So we cover a lot of use cases with intrusion detection honeypots. So hopefully now you kind of get some of the, the value proposition of IDH for detection. So I think the question then turns to deploying IDH and how we do that in a way that's that's pretty easy. And there's a lot of ground to cover here. We're going to focus on, on one specific technique here with, with Honey Services. I will say that many Honey tokens and Honey credentials can be created from existing OS functionality and tools. So you probably heard of law bins, living off the land binaries that attackers will use. I like to think of this as law IDH, living off the land IDH because we're using existing operating system functionality and so on. I think that's pretty cool. Honey services are a little bit trickier. You can certainly use legitimate services. So if you want to set up a fake web server, you can use real web server software and just really restrict it. I find that a little bit time consuming in most cases, and you can potentially expose some attack service you don't want to accidentally. So I really like to use pre-built services that are specifically for honeypots um, for a lot of reasons. Um, certainly the one I just mentioned, but also because the logging is really designed around that specific um, use case uh, for these purpose built tools. A lot of tools available for this. The one that's most relevant for us today is a tool called Open Canary. It's made by the folks at Thinkst who also make a commercial honeypot tool, which I find um, to be pretty useful and pretty good. But Open Canary is free, it's open source. Um, it base, it's very simple, it's Python and it has a configuration file. Um, you would edit the configuration file, say what services you want to run, and, um, and basically launch the Python script and it will run those um, and you can use those for an IDH. As you can see in my list on the screen, uh, there are lots of different options and they all provide some level of interactivity. So it's just not just advertising that the HTTP port is available. Um, it will allow an attacker to actually browse a, website, a fake website that you allow it to host. Uh, it will not simply uh, say SSH is available. It will allow the attacker to attempt to log in and you can collect the credentials they use. Um, and maybe if they're stolen credentials, you know where the attacker might have been on your network. So a lot of flexibility there. I really like Open Canary as a good uh, starting point for Honey Services. And with that in mind, I think um, I think one of the big lingering questions here is, well, you know, I want to I want to deploy um, something like Open Canary, but it's a lot of work maybe sometimes to integrate that into our security monitoring stack. So, you know, I guess now if only there were some sort of platform, a platform whose goals was to simplify the deployment and management of security monitoring infrastructure. We're at Security Onion Con, right? 
So this is where we're going to get to show you some, some cool stuff that uh, um, particularly Josh has developed and um, something really called the IDH node, right? We have these nodes in Security Onion. So uh, Josh and I are really excited to share with you a new capability that allows you to turn a Security Onion forward node into an IDH node running Open Canary. This allows you to deploy a Honey service in such a way that its alerts and logs go straight into your Security Onion monitoring pipeline. And it really just simplifies and, simplifies and automates a whole lot of useful things. So with that said, I know you're excited to see it. I'm going to turn things over to Josh. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, I want to take just a minute and demo for you a new integration that I've put together that allows you to um, integrate a intrusion detection honeypot into Security Onion. Uh, it takes a forward node that you already have installed in your grid and converts it over to an IDH node. So to start off, we have to be running a distributed grid in Security Onion. You'll see that I have uh, SO Manager, which is our manager search node, and two forward nodes. All right, so that's the first requirement because what we're going to do is we're going to take this forward node and convert it over to a uh, to a IDH node. So from there, um, let's go over to the GitHub repo. Uh, the link will be available for you. This is the SO-IDH repo. We're going to uh, git clone this onto uh, the manager. All right, so you can see that I am SSH'd into the manager. So I'll git clone that repo and then I'll CD into it. And uh, we'll see there are a few files. We have this IDH uh, setup.sh script. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and run that script with sudo. And it's gonna do a couple things. It's going to first check to make sure that uh, we're on a manager. This script has to be run on a manager. Then checks the version of Security Onion running. Uh, the minimum version needed is 2.3.80 to make sure this works correctly. And then uh, there's a message here, no input found. So the actual usage is the script name and then the forward node host name that you are targeting. And the script uh, helpfully lists a couple or uh, all of the available forward nodes. You can see we have two right here. So we'll go ahead and copy and paste this one. Rerun this, but this time we're going to select uh, sensor 05 to be targeted. It's going to rerun our manager and version checks. It found the forward node and it is up and responding. So we get a final warning here. This experimental script will convert a forward node into an intrusion detection honeypot node. It is experimental and a work in progress. Warning, exclamation point, exclamation point. This script will stop all sensor services on the following forward node and convert it to an IDH node. This is what we are targeting. So do we want to continue? Yes. So it's going to do a few things. It's going to disable the sensor services on the forward node like Zeek and Siricata and Steno. Uh, it's then going to copy down a salt state and apply that. And that can certainly take some time on the node, uh, depending on the environment and how, um, you know, what kind of system resources that that forward node has. That salt state will build the open canary Docker container, uh, configure file beat to make sure that um, it sends over the logs over to the, the manager, as well as some other pieces of configuration. You can see that we do have IDH setup complete. Doesn't look like any errors. Uh, if the script runs into errors, uh, it will say so. And it will also uh, list out where you can find the log with the errors that it ran into. Now we see that the setup completed on our sensor and we have a default IDH configuration. We have the SSH and VNC uh, Honey services um, accessible on TCP 2222 and 5900 and accessible from all networks from a, from a firewall perspective. So to be clear here, the firewall configuration was applied only to this forward node. 
this firewall configuration is not um, set for any other node on the grid, just the IDH node that we were targeting. So if this is the case, we should be able to access SSH on this port. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this. We'll say SSH-P uh, for port 2222 and IP address and run that. And we do get a, uh, an accepted connection. So I'll put in my super secret password of Tor. And of course it's not gonna work. This is a honey service. Um, we don't have that set up. So it uh, looks like I was able to successfully connect to the SSH Honey service. If that's the case, logs were generated of this attempt. And we should be able to see those logs over in Security Onion. So let's pivot back over to uh, Security Onion and check it out. If I go over to the Hunt interface, we'll see that uh, my currently I'm grouping all my logs by event.module and event.dataset. So if I scroll down, I see lots of Zeek logs. I'm gonna go ahead and filter those out. And then I do actually see open canary logs and I'll filter specifically for that. Now there are different types of open canary logs uh, generated. There's kind of the, the you know, the logs generated about the service itself. It just, you know, simply says it added the service, right? So kind of metadata about the service and what's running. And then finally we have actual access logs. Um, so we have logs generated from my local system, which we, uh, which I just used to access the honey service on port 2222. Now, if I drill down, We'll see a lot more information. Um, our destination host, port, time, uh, file, log, uh, the file path. You can see we have the password that I, that I sent and the username. And then this is the raw log that came from Open Canary. So this is looking pretty good, but um, if you recall, IDH is one of the key parts to an IDH is that it should be low volume. And if, you know, any events coming in from probing and accessing the services are pretty high uh, quality events or events that we want to get alerted for. So rather than having to make you hunt through all this data on a regular basis, we also create a playbook uh, alert for it. Now, um, I do have two created here because I was testing this just a couple minutes ago. Uh, but as part of the setup process, we do uh, create and activate a playbook play around SSH. Uh, if you're not familiar with Security Onion Playbook, it's a tool that allows you to write Sigma rules and import them as detection plays and then make that play active, which will use a last alert in the back end to generate any alerts uh, that it finds based on your play that you wrote. All right. So we have one again, built for when SSH is accessed and the objective is detects when the SSH service on a SO IDH node has been probed. So if this is the case, we should have gotten an alert over in the alerts interface for uh, when SSH was accessed. Let me filter out the Sierra alerts. And uh, there we go right there, playbook. So SO dash, or excuse me, SO IDH SSH was accessed. All right, so we could drill down into this and get more detail about the alert, but this alert was based off of that data that we saw in the hunt just a minute ago, which was generated by Open Canary, which was generated because I probed or I tried to connect to the, uh, the SSH service on our IDH node. So pretty great stuff. Um, but again, going back to the cons the concepts behind IDH is that it has to be customized for your environment. You don't wanna just use the default configuration that we've set up for you. So I wanna show you how to edit the default configuration of your IDH node and apply that configuration. Let's go back to our terminal. And if we come over to the summary here, 
We saw this, we didn't read it though. So open canary config is on the IDH node in this uh, folder right here. Um, and then you can run this command on the manager to apply any configuration changes. So you're going to make configuration changes um, in the configuration file here and uh, apply it running this command on the manager. So first we'll SSH into our IDH node. SSH sysadmin at login. And we need to open up our configuration file. It's sudo vi. It should be open uh, canary.conf. If you're not familiar with open canary configuration, no worries. It's uh, fairly simple. We have a bunch of canary services or honeypot services that we can enable, like Git and FTP and HTTP. We can enable them with a line like this. And then we have options. So with like port options or banner options. All right. So for right now, I'm just going to enable FTP. Change this to true. I'm going to leave the port as 21 and the banner um, as it is the default right now. So I'll go ahead and save that. And we're going to come over to the manager. And we're going to run this command on the manager. Now, one of the other pieces to this command is if we are changing configuration that requires a new open port on the IDH node, we just list the port number as a parameter and that will take it in and add the necessary uh, firewall configuration. So let's go ahead and run this. Oop. Yep. Let's try that again. Shouldn't take too long. It's going to restart the IDH Docker container and open up that port that we specified. All right, so now if everything worked, I should be able to go over to my uh, local terminal, say FTP, uh, my IP address, port 21, and check that out. It's trying to connect to the FTP server. Put in my, oh, yep, whatever. Password required for Tor, Tor, Tor. That's fine. Sorry, authentication failed, so I'll quit out of that. And again, we should be able to pop open Hunt and see the alerts for FTP inside. I uh, may need to give it just a second here. Yeah, we'll give it a second here. Oh, there it is right there. All right, so source IP is my local host and destination port is 21. And if we scroll down, we'll see that we have my password and username as Tor. All right. So that is how you customize your IDH or the Open Canary uh, configuration for IDH. And uh, that's about it for this demo. Hopefully that's making sense. So we started out with a distributed grid uh, inside Security Onion. We downloaded the, uh, the repo and we ran the shell script, which uh, converted our forward node into an IDH node. We tested uh, and verified that the SSH um, uh, traffic was uh, generating logs uh, with Open Canary. We can see them in Hunt. It generated an alert because of playbook. And then, when we, and then we went and actually edited our Open Canary configuration and uh, tested that as well for FTP. So uh, let me know if you have any issues or run into any problems. Um, this link for this repo will be available. Feel free to drop in a, a question either on Twitter at Defense of Depth or under the issues section here. Thanks, Josh. That was awesome. I'm really excited to see it. There's a lot of things to love about this integration and this tool. It's certainly extensible, whether it's through Open Canary itself or through um, applying Python skills if you want to do something the native tool can't do. Um, it's also obviously open source, which is, is pretty neat. Um, it's automated through the magic of Security Onion. You get all your alerts right there alongside everything else, and you can investigate it alongside other relevant data. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. And there's a lot of room to extend this with the integration 
integration with Playbook, which obviously relies on Sigma rules. So there's a lot to be done there. Um, obviously, there's a lot we couldn't cover in the short time frame surrounding um, things like IDH deployment best practices and so on. Um, if you want to learn more about that, then I think the next best place to turn is my book, Intrusion Detection Honeypots, or the associated course. You'll see a link to that here in just a moment. Uh, it probably also is worth saying that this is uh, a new feature, this new script, so it's uh, not officially supported as of now um, by Security Onion. It's, it's an individual effort here, mostly by Josh. Um, it is beta and it's fairly bare bones. I think there's a lot that can be done with it, a lot of ways to take this and really improve on it or leverage other sorts of honeypots. So the key thing is if you really like the idea, download the script, uh, convert, one, convert a forward node that, uh, to, into an intrusion detection honeypot, test it and tell us what you think. And if you've got some cool ideas for what to do next, uh, let Josh or I know. And I think there's a lot of uh, great things that can come of that. Uh, with that said, that's going to wrap it up for Josh and I here in a moment. Again, I'll put a, a link or a slide on the screen with links to download the script as well as some additional information, including uh, mine and Josh's contact information. Thank you all so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Hear me? I got you. All right, all right, all right. So I think we're just doing a uh, live Q&A right now, Chris. So um, by the way, good to have you here in person. Um, well, as in person as I could be, it just, it just one second before we get started, there's, there's something I need to do and I just want to make sure I don't forget it because I'm really bad with my to-do list and my goals, so I just want to <laughs> Sounds good. That, that's all the trolling you got, Chris? That's it? It's, it, you know, COVID, it's, it's a crazy year. Four, four it's dollars, true. Four it's true. All right. Uh, any questions, comments, or snide remarks? If you had snide remarks, we'll hand those off to Chris at this point. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Would you mind, um, yes, push to talk, thank you. Yeah, so the question was, uh, that script turns, looks like it turns the IDH node, excuse me, the forward node into an IDH node. Could you actually do both at the same time? Um, it, it specifically disables the sensor services, so you could technically turn them back on. Um, but one of the big things with IDH is try to running, running minimal services as much as possible, as well as um, just from an attack service perspective, just trying to run it as minimally as possible. Um, but you certainly could run both, and that, from a technical perspective, I don't see why you couldn't do that. Um, yeah, you could certainly do that. I would still recommend, just from my background, is one, um, you know, one uh, function per node is really what I would recommend. And I don't know, Chris, if you have any, any comments on that. Uh, no, I, I pretty much agree with what you said. Okay. I, I would keep those functions uh, generally separate. Yes, yeah, great question. So if we're gonna be minimizing the amount of resources anyways, then the assumption is, is the resources would be pretty minimal, yeah. So because we're setting up a, the IDH node after, um, it's already been set up as a forward node, initially you might have to bump up the resources just to kind of get it running, uh, but you could certainly reduce them and just run it as a VM. I mean, the, doc <coughs> excuse me, the Docker container for Open Canary is really, really minimal, um, so you really will not need met much resources to run that. Yep, great question. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead.
Yes. Yeah, so again, the question is, is ultimately long term, you would want to have multiple IDH nodes because you're going to customize it for your environment. You may have different um, environments, different facilities. Um, because this is more of an experimental proof of concept, um, it, it was really for standing up, you know, a one shot, but you could certainly, dip, you know, have multiple um, IDH nodes in different locations and um, to reapply the configuration, you may have to do some tweaks because right now it's just targeting kind of any IDH node out there. Uh, honestly, I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards and maybe we can get some ideas on how to make it more specific. Oh, no, I totally agree. And that's, that's why I felt like after working through Chris's book last year and with my background in running security onion, I can definitely see the power of an IDH node internally and then deploying it with security onion. If I'm already deploying sensors in all my sites, and let's throw a couple more IDH nodes out there for just another, <clears throat> another type of detection. So I'm right there with you. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I believe the question I heard, I heard most of it, I believe the question was is essentially <clears throat> there's more attack surface. You, you're, you're adding a new uh, type of node to your environment, uh, specifically to your security ending grid. What's the risk and what are the concerns of adding this functionality? Can it, you know, if it gets compromised, can they come back to the security ending grid? Is that the basic idea? Yes. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah, so the, the, the idea is that anytime we add new functionality, there is certainly going to be an increase in attack surface, right? And so um, the difference here or the, the, the idea is that the open canary and the way it's set up is that it's very low interaction. And so the risk is much decreased. Um, unlike like uh, Chris mentioned, you could certainly set up your own web server and kind of try to lock it down that would be much more difficult to make more secure than just simply starting out with like Open Canary. Uh, secondly, Open Canary is running as a Docker container. It only binds, um, it's like read-only bind to configuration file on the host of the Security Onion host, and it has read-write to the NSM logs folder, so it can output its logs, and that's it. So again, it's just running a Docker container. Um, and then there's some other kind of technical limitations in play, and so, Chris and I have talked about this, that there's certainly risk anytime you add additional functionality. However, we feel like the risk is, is pretty small from that perspective. You have anything to add to that, Chris? Yeah, I'll jump there. I certainly agree with everything that you said there. Um, you know, I, this is one of the reasons I really like purpose-built Honeypot tools like Open yeah. Canary. Um, there are certainly use cases where you might deploy, you know, a real service for a Honeypot. So maybe you actually deploy a system running SSH to serve as an SSH Honeypot but then you get all the attack surface that comes along with that. Um, and that, that can be a little problem to manage and something you have to think through uh, quite a bit. Uh, with something like this, it's really not designed to take a lot of complex input. It's gonna be incredibly simple and when you decrease the amount of input that something can take, you ultimately are decreasing the attack surface to a large degree. So um, that's one of the reasons why I like Open Canary and tools like it. It's one of the reasons we chose that for this initial integration. Um, it just really limits that attack service very, very dramatically when these tools are built with honeypot use in mind. Good questions. Yes, Mr. Mike. Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. So the, the question is, is um, should we deploy this on like the public internet on, uh, 
you know, on a cloud provider and it's like publicly accessible. That's not, it goes back to cr what Chris was talking about early on in the presentation is this is something that you're deploying internally. Um, you're not putting out on the public internet, right? Chris, anything to add to that? Um, I, I did not hear the question, but it sounds, it sounds like we're talking internal versus external deployment. Where, where's the best place to deploy something like this? Yeah, so certainly in, inside the network, um, it's going to, you know, with OpenGAL, you can have it mimic lots of different things. Uh, there's a lot that goes into, and certainly more than we can get into here just now, about how you and where you choose to, choose to deploy these things. But generally, you're going to mimic something. You're either going to try to blend in with other things so that when an attacker, you know, scans the whole subnet, they're going to they're hit this. Or when they, you know, try to log into a system via RDP, they're going to see that this is one of many RDP systems. They might try to log into it that way. So that's blending in. Uh, the other opportunity here is really standing out. So take, taking something and creating a system that really just stands out amongst everything else so that an attacker will see that and, and think it may be of interest or value. So if there are a lot um, of Windows systems, you know, putting an SSH honeypot out there. If there um, are a lot of Linux systems, putting an RDP honeypot out there. You can base it on systems, service, um, just finding some way to make it stand out beyond um, the things that it's going to share uh, or be adjacent to on the network. So those are really kind of the big guiding principles um, that I use when I'm trying to figure out where to deploy these things and what to mimic. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mike. One more question. One final, final question. It's got to be a good one. Yes, all the way up there. There we go. Yeah, so I think the question was is um, <clears throat> from a network performance perspective, um, is there any concerns if someone's like trying to do brute forcing against a service or something like that? Um, so to be clear, uh, this forward node, this converted forward node is just simply sending the logs from Open Canary. So it's not sending any PCAP or anything like that to the manager. So it's just sending logs. So you're not going to get anything from that perspective. And if someone's brute forcing this service, uh, then they're certainly going to be trying to brute force other services in your environment. Better to brute force this one so that you get alerts and you know about it, right? That's kind of the thought process there. I think that was, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the, the whole thing is if someone tries to brute force it, we're going to know that they're there, right? You're yeah. going to know someone's doing that and then you can investigate it. So that's, that's, that's one of the great things about these approaches is, is if an attacker wants to do something bad to this honeypot beyond what it's, it's supposed to do or even within the scope of what it's supposed to do, they have to interact with it. And once they do that very first interaction, uh, which is usually going to be when they're probing it, not necessarily trying to do anything else, we're going to know that they're there and we can investigate it. And um, I'm not going to say it's game over, but it's certainly the first step on the way to game over for the bad guy. All right. I think that's it. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Chris. Um, Bill, anything to... Okay. Thank you.